<clears throat> Psalm 89 and Isaiah chapter 6. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, because it is another day that you have made, and therefore we should rejoice and be glad in it. And when we truly start to think of the many blessings you've already given to us in just a short amount of this day, it's astounding and a blessing to know that you care for us, you care about us, and you have taken such wonderful care of us. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you that for the knowledge to know that your mercies do truly endure forever. And we thank you, Lord, for this time with your word. Because it is your word that, that will stand out and will remember. It is your word that grows us and changes us and brings us ever closer to Jesus Christ. And it is your word that helps us through each day. It's your word that gives us the comfort that we need and the joy that we need. To be able to see through your word what you've done in the past, the promises you have made of the future, and to know that you keep every one of them. It is truly a blessing to know. And I pray that this time with your word would bless you, that you would be magnified and exalted and not myself. And I pray, Lord, that that you would give us your strength, your wisdom. Help us, Lord, to walk in that renewed obedience towards you. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 89, we're going to start at verse 3 this week. Psalm 89, verse 3. I have, made a co I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever, and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. So David, David was a man that was after the Lord's heart, meaning that David sought to follow the Lord God. David was chosen by God, to be the second king of Israel, not because David was handsome, intelligent, or had been in politics for many years. No. David had been a shepherd, and he sought to follow the Lord. And his main qualification was just that, that he sought to follow the Lord. David was faithful to God, and he wrote many psalms to praise God, and he sought to bless the Lord. Now, yes, David was still a sinner, and there were consequences for his sins, just as there are consequences for your own sins. But David was sensitive to those, and he repented of his sins, and God forgave him of those sins. And you can read about that in, like, Psalm 51 and such. You read of David's great repentance. For his sins. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a covenant with David. In chapter 7, verse 12 reads, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. 
So the Lord God of heaven was promising to David <coughs> that he would always have a son on the throne. And that continued as the king of the Jews was nailed to the cross and he gave up his life. The Lord promised that the kingdom would be ruled by David's son and it would endure forever. Now, no, there is not a king that rules in Israel today, but God has still not broken his covenant with David. Ultimately, it is God's kingdom. And it is not an earthly one, but heavenly. And heavenly is the only kingdom that will endure forever <clears throat> you think of all the great dynasties and empires that have lasted throughout the years but they've never endured for very long if anything America is the uh, is unusual because it has lasted over 200 years but who knows how long God's kingdom will endure forever why? Because Jesus Christ is king. And one day he will reign here on earth visibly. Look again at Psalm 89, verse 4. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. The Lord has kept his promise to David and to all those that are his disciples. The believers are kings, and one day we will rule here under Jesus Christ. Believers will rule and judge in some fashion. <coughs> the Lord is faithful, and he can be trusted. So he has told us we're a royal priesthood. We will be kings. We will be judges. He doesn't give us the details, but we don't need the details right now. He's got it all under control in the meantime. Look at verse 5. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. All of nature praises the Lord. Psalm 19, verse 1 tells us, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. God made the stars too. And he knows the names of them all. And you can look at a clear sky at night or by day and see the many wonders that the heavens have to offer. Jesus Christ is worthy of all praise. And he is to be glorified and lifted up for all to see. Consider that God created everything and originally it was all very good. But sadly, Adam sinned against God, and the curse was then put upon everything. And men and women suffer today from the consequences of Adam's and Eve's sin. This is a cursed world. We have to work by the sweat of our brow. There's so much that, that could have been so different if Adam and Eve had not sinned. But it is a cursed world. But then you can still look at the heavens and see how they glorify God. There is an order and a consistency to the universe. The stars, as they move about the sky, move in an organized manner. And all of those things glorify God. You can look, for example, at the Grand Canyon and marvel at the colors and the formations and the size and the depth of it. And then think about how a whole lot of water in a very short amount of time carved out the Grand Canyon. The firmament showeth his handiwork. You can look at the giant sequoia trees and consider how tall and thick they are. You can walk through any of the parks around here and see the colors of the flowers and trees and watch the birds flit about and catch a glimpse of a deer bounding through a field and see how the firmament showeth his handiwork. The heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord. 
God can fit the universe in the span of his hand and to think that he created it all by just speaking. What amazing God we serve. Amen. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And you look at the second phrase of verse 5, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. The congregation of the saints would be fellow believers gathered together, and we will one day join that chorus and praise the Lord God of heaven We'll be singing with them. Amen. And today, the Lord is faithful toward his children, those that have repented of their sins and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's faithfulness toward you and I is alone worthy of our praise and worship. Because he has been faithful, much more so than we have been faithful. Amen. Now, people... People love to sing the praises of their sports teams, their favorite entertainment stars, politicians, and so on. But the Lord God alone is worthy of that praise. And the more you know the Lord, and the more time you spend with him in prayer and in his word, the more you see his works, and the more you will marvel over his goodness and his order and how he is created. And what that will do is then lead you to praise him all the more and sing of his mercies that endure forever. And what it will do for you is it will create a longing, a longing to see Jesus Christ, a longing to see heaven, a longing to sing that new song that he will put in your mouth as you will eternally praise the Lord. I look forward to that day. I love my time here on earth, but I look forward to that better day ahead. I look forward to that. I don't want to leave anybody behind, but I look forward to seeing my Savior. That's what we have to look forward to. Look at verse 6. <clears throat> For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? And think about it. Who can be compared to God and come out ahead? Nobody. Nobody can match up to the Lord. The devil, the devil thought he could be compared to the Lord. And the devil's rebellion saw him and the fallen angels thrown out of heaven. There is no man on this earth and there is no woman on this earth that can be compared to God and come anywhere even remotely near being his equal. Nobody. There was no one strong enough. There was no one smart enough. There was no one more loving. There was no one more compassionate. There was no one more perfect. And, there, and, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And God knows this. Man in his sin is lost and without hope, without Jesus Christ. And only through Jesus Christ can man be reconciled with the Lord. There is no other way. But people will try to compare themselves. People will declare themselves to be God. You think about in the book of Acts, and one of the Herods, he had a, a shiny new outfit that he had put on. And, and he stood up before all the people and he began to speak. And what happened? The people heard him and they said, oh, he speaks like he's one of the gods. And it went right to his head. And God took care of that. He was eaten by worms from the inside. What a way to go. But so many of the kings end up thinking, and emperors and rulers and dictators end up thinking, I'm a god. And you see it across all cultures. They're in leadership. They must be a God. They're not. 
They're nowhere near the one true God of heaven because they sin. God does not sin. And, and, and nobody can be compared to him. People will have tried through the years and shook their fist at God, and God laughs and holds them in derision, is what Psalm 2 tells us. Because they've tried to compare themselves to the incomparable. Look at verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Keep your finger here in, in, in Psalm 89. Go over to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. So God is to be greatly feared in the assembly of the saints. And the Lord should be looked upon with awe and reverence. The Lord must be respected. That's the idea of feared and seen as the King and Lord that he alone is. Isaiah chapter 6, look at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So these angels, they stood above the Lord and they cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Revelation chapter 4 tells you that the four beasts in heaven cry out all night and all day, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And so they are eternally praising the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lamb of God is worthy of all praise. But take note in Isaiah chapter 6 here, the seraphim, they have six wings. And so it says twain, twain means two. So they have two wings that they fly with, they have two wings that cover their feet, and the other two cover their faces. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. So the angels, you think about this, picture it as best you can, because we don't know for sure what a seraphim looks like, but think about it, they veil their faces with their wings, as they cry out their everlasting praise of the thrice holy God. And when you approach the throne of grace and mercy to worship the Lord, it must be done with humbleness of mind and heart. The seraphim cover their faces. May you have the same humility before the Lord in your praise of him. There must be that fear of the Lord daily in your life where you acknowledge and accept and take up your cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the idea of the fear of the Lord for the believer. We're not to be scared or terrified of him, but we should be in awe of him and have that healthy respect for him, for who he is. There must be that humble willingness to say to the Lord, not my will, but thine. There must be that drive to say to the Lord, none of self and all of thee. There must be that striving for holiness, and there must be godly compassion and love for the Lord and for others. Is your praise for the Lord for yourself and your pleasure? Or is your praise for the Lord, for the Lord? Go back over to Psalm 89. Look at verse 8. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, 
or to thy faithfulness round about thee. There is none to be compared to the Lord. There are men and women that have tried to compare themselves to God and they have tried to claim to be deity. And there are false Christs in the past and there will be false Jesus Christs in the future. And none of them are worthy to be compared to the real Jesus Christ. But we, you can find people that will claim to be Jesus Christ. I can remember watching a news report some years ago talking about four different people that claimed they were Jesus Christ. That doesn't even make sense. You know, but what was sad was one of them claimed to be Jesus Christ reincarnated. It just shows how little they understood the Bible and what the Bible says, because there is no reincarnation. But what has been the one thing that's common with each of these false Christs is that they all will die. They're not deity. They will die, and sadly they will die in their sins. They, they will pre proclaim to be the living word of God, and yet their words and their actions will contradict the Bible. And despite their outrageous claims, they are still human, and they will sin and be unfaithful to their followers. There is only one that promises to be faithful, and he cannot lie, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is because Jesus Christ cannot sin and has never sinned. He is the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Verse 9. Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. So you have to remember, for many centuries, to travel on the seas was a dangerous and frightful thought. The ocean's conditions could quickly change without warning, from dead calm to raging storms in mere moments. And the Lord is sovereign over the seas. And remember, remember when the disciples woke up Jesus Christ as they sailed on the Sea of Galilee during a terrifying storm, and Jesus stood and spoke to the sea, Peace, be still, and the storm stopped. And the Sea of Galilee is apparently well known for having, having sudden storms come up out of no, with no warning to them. The Lord is in control of all things. At the Red Sea, as Moses and the Israelites stood on the shore, and the Egyptian army was charging at them, at the Lord's command, the waves arose, and they stood upright and still, and the Israelites were able to walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. And to me, that's... <coughs> That's as much, that's the part of the miracle that stands out for me as much as anything. When, when I've gone swimming in a lake or whatever, and you know, you feel the, the, the wet muck under the water under your feet. They didn't have that issue. They were able to walk across the Red Sea on dry ground. Psalm 89, verse 10. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces, as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. For as for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. Now the Rahab that is referred to here, God has chosen that the word Rahab is another name for Egypt. And that's what we see in this. And so Egypt, of course, was a major power in this world for a very long time and was seldom an ally of Israel. Egypt had enslaved the Israelites a number of years after Jacob and his family settled there. And it was the Egyptians that fought the Israelites over the years, often. And one day, the Lord will take care of his enemies. His foes will be scattered defeated and beaten. 
one day the Lord's enemies will only be able to bend the knee in supplication to the Lord. And because of his strong arm, no army will be able to defeat the Lord. No army will be able to fight against the Lord and win. And when you think about when you read in the book of Revelation and that final battle after Satan has been released after a thousand years in the bottomless pit, he'll be released for a short time and he'll gather together all the armies of the world and they will all meet together in the Middle East and they'll be defeated just like that. Here we go. Just like that. Fire will come down and they'll be done. When Jesus Christ comes the first time, all he's going to have to do is speak. And the sword of his mouth, his words, will take out his enemies. That's how powerful God is. People have no idea. They have no idea. They want to rail against him. Those are the ones that should be afraid. Jesus himself said, don't be afraid of those that can hurt you physically and kill you. But be afraid of him that can destroy your soul. That would be God. But for the believer, we don't have to fear him in that fashion. We fear him in that we love him and we respect him for who he is. That's what we have to look forward to. Now you look at verse 11 Verse 11 tells you that everything is God's. And the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills as well. The Lord is willing and able to abundantly bless his children. He cannot run out of his riches. He cannot run out of his mercy. He cannot run out of his love. The Lord is the foundation that everyone so desperately needs. The heavens and the earth are his, and the world in its fullness is his. Why? Well, he created them. He is the foundation of them all. All things consist because of him. The world in its fullness is God's, and it is his to do with as he desires. However, he will only act within the confines of his holy nature. And really, that should be a comfort to us. Because he has also promised to never lie, and to never deceive, and to never desert you. The Lord Jesus Christ can be fully trusted because he has proven himself to be fully faithful. And just as God has kept his covenant with David, God has kept his promise to those that have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has more than the means and ability to care for his own, and he will never forsake his own. And we have seen that consistently over the years. God is faithful. He is faithful. And he has been so good, so very good to us. And even in the difficultest of times, he has still been so good. And even if he never blesses me again, he has still been so good. And I still have more than enough to continue to sing his praises about. And more than enough to be able to tell people, do you know my Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus Christ? He wants you to know him. This is what he did for you in his great love for you. And that's what we have. We have something more precious than anything else. We can, we can go down to the Walmart and empty the store out and bring everything home. And then they'll restock the store again the next week. We'll go down and buy it all again and fill it into our next home. But we'll still never have enough. And none of it will be comparable to Jesus Christ. Stuff won't make you happy. Things of this world will make you happy. Jesus Christ brings joy, which is far better than happiness. And we need to stay close to him every day, not just Sundays, but every day stay close to him. And let's pray. <clears throat> oh, 
Our God and our Father, again, I thank you for this time with your word. And Lord, I thank, thank you that you are faithful to us and your mercy has been great upon us. And I thank you, Lord, that we can trust you because you have shown yourself to be trustworthy. And I pray that daily we would seek your strength and your wisdom. I pray that daily we would walk in renewed obedience towards you, looking to serve you and to minister unto others. And Lord, I pray that we would grow in our fear of you, that we would grow in your word and grow in our faith because of your word and as we go through this week pray that you would equip us and prepare those ahead of us to be able to hear and respond to your word in these things i pray in jesus's holy name amen